Hi, it's Ms. Mason again, reading Counting by Sevens by Holly Goldberg Sloan, Chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3 As a family, we threw ourselves into growing things. I have photos from the early trips to buy seeds and pick out young plants. I look insanely excited. Early on, I adopted my gardening outfit. It did not change over the years. You could say it was my uniform. I almost always wore a khaki shirt and a red hat for sun protection. Red is my favorite color because it is very important in the plant world. I had tan pants with built-in knee pads and lace-up leather work boots. This outfit was designed for practical reasons. My unruly long curly hair was pulled back and secured by some sort of clip. I had magnifying glasses, like the elderly wear, for close-up inspection. In my garden, in this uniform, I was determined through chemical analysis at the age of seven, that the brown flecks that appeared on the backyard furniture were bee poops. I was astonished that more people had not figured this out before. In an ideal world, I would have spent 24 hours a day conducting investigations, but rest is critically important for development in young people. I calculated my exact biorhythms, and I needed seven hours and 47 minutes of rest every night. Not just because I was obsessed with the number seven, which is the case, but because that's how long my circadian rhythms were set. It's chemical, isn't everything? I was told that I lived too much inside my head. Maybe because of this, I haven't done that well at school and I've never made many friends. But my garden gave me a window into other aspects of companionship. When I was eight years old, a flock of wild green drummed parrots moved into the fishtail palm tree by the back wooden fence. A pair built a nest and I was able to witness the arrival of parrot babies. Each one of those little birds had their own distinctive chirp. I'm pretty sure only the mom green rumped parrot and I knew this. When the littlest parrot was pushed from the nest, I rescued the tiny creature, naming him Fallen. With careful hand feeding that in the beginning went around the clock, I was able to parrot parent. When Fallen was finally strong enough to fly, I reintroduced him back to his flock. It was incredibly rewarding, but it was also heartbreaking. It has been my experience that rewarding and heartbreaking often go hand in hand. In grade school at Rose Elementary, I had one true companion. Her name was Margaret Z. Buckle. She made up the Z because she didn't have a middle name, and she had strong feelings about being seen as an individual. But Margaret, don't ever call her Peggy, moved away the summer after fifth grade. Her mother is a petroleum engineer, and she got transferred to Canada. Despite the distance, I thought that Margaret and I would stay really close. And in the beginning, it was like that. But I guess people are a lot more open in Canada, because in Bakersfield, it was just Margaret and me against the world. Up there, she has all kinds of friends. Now, on the rare times when we correspond, she brings up things like the new sweater she got, or a band she likes. She doesn't want to talk about Cairo to Philly, which is a pollination of plants by bats. She's moved on. Who can blame her? With Margaret in Canada, I was hoping that Sequoia Middle School would open up new avenues for friendship. It hasn't worked out that way. I'm small for my age, but I had a lot of anticipation about becoming a Sequoia giant. Just the fact that the place has a tree as a mascot seems so promising. The school on the other side of town and it was supposed to give me a fresh start since the kids from my elementary all went to Emerson. My parents got special permission from the district to move me there. Mom and Dad believed that I'd never found a teacher who truly understood me. I think it was more accurate to say I'd never understood any of my teachers. There's a difference. Right before school began in the fall, the anticipation I felt was like waiting for my Amorphalophilus personophilus to, bro to bloom. I went through a period of obsessively cultivating rare corpse flowers. My initial attraction to this strange looking blossom. The deep purplish red petals resembled sheets of velvet fabric that could line a casket. And the long aggressive yellowy stigma jutting out from the center is like a jaundiced old man's finger. But the plant's reputation comes from its smell. Because when the bloom opens, it's like having a dead body pop up from the soil. The stink is simply incredibly disgusting. I mean, it really takes some adjustment. No animal wants to get close, much less munch on the reeking, exotic, wine-colored blossom. 
It's a reverse perfume. I believe that going to middle school would be life-changing. I saw myself as a rare plant, prepared to unfurl hidden layers, but I truly hoped that I wouldn't stink up the place. I tried to fit in. I researched teenagers, which was interesting because I was close to becoming one. I read about teenage driving, teenage runaways, and teenage dropout rates, and it was a shocker. But none of the research provided much enlightenment on my number one area of real interest, teenage friendship. If the media is to be believed, teenagers are too busy breaking laws and trying to kill themselves and the people around them to form any bonds of attachment. Unless, of course, those bonds produce a teenage pregnancy. The literature had a lot of information on that. Right before I started middle school, I had a physical. The exam went much, much, much better than expected because for the first time I had an actual medical issue. I had been waiting for 12 long years for this to happen. I needed glasses. Yes, the level of correction was slight. And yes, it could have been brought on in part by eye strain. Apparently I focused too long on something right in front of me, like a book or a computer screen, and I don't look away into the distance and refocus enough. So I congratulated myself on this achievement because I had been hoping for some form of myopia, and now I had it. After the exam, I went to the ophthalmologist and I picked out my eyeglasses. I was drawn to frames that looked like what Gandhi wore. They were round, wire-rimmed, and very old school, according to the woman who deals with that part of the process. They were perfect, because I was going forward in the brave new world in peace. A week before the first day of classes, I made another big decision. We were having breakfast, and I swallowed a large bite of my Healthy Start meal, which consists of beet greens topped with flax seeds, both homegrown, and then I said, I have figured out what I'm going to wear for my first day at Sequoia. My father was at the sink, sneaking a bite of a donut. I did my best to keep junk food away from these people, but they covered up a lot of their eating habits. My dad quickly swallowed a piece of his fudge puppy and asked, and what will that be? I was pleased. I'll be wearing my gardening outfit. Dad must have taken too large of a bite, because it sounded like fudge donut was caught in his throat. He managed to say, are you sure about that? Of course I was sure, but I stayed low-key. Yes, but I won't put binoculars around my neck, if that's what you're concerned about. My mom, who up until this point was unloaded the dishwasher, turned around. I could see her face. She looked pained. Like maybe she just put away a whole load of dirty dishes, which is something that has happened before. Her face smoothed out and she said, What an interesting idea, honey. But I'm wondering, will people make the connection? Maybe it's better to wear a brighter color, like something red. You love red. They didn't get it. The first day at middle school was a chance to make a new introduction. I needed to convey to the group a sense of my identity, while keeping a few of the basic elements of my character under wraps. I couldn't stop myself from explaining. I'm making a statement about my commitment to the natural world. I saw him exchange quick looks. My dad had fudge frosting on his front teeth. But I wasn't going to point this out, especially after he said, Of course, you are so right. I looked down into my breakfast bowl and began counting the flax seeds, multiplying them by sevens. Seven, fourteen, twenty-one, twenty-eight, thirty-five, forty-two, forty-nine, fifty-six, sixty-three, seventy, seventy-seven, eighty-four, ninety-one, ninety-eight, one hundred five, one twelve, one nineteen. 126, 133, 140, 147, 154, 161, 168, 175, 182, 189, 196, 203, 210, 217, 224, 231, 238, 245, 252, 259, 266, 273, 280, 287, 294, 301, 308, 315, 322, 329, 336, 343, 350, 357, 364, 371, 378, 385, 392, 399, 406, 413, 420, 427, 434, 441, 448, 455, 462, 469, 476, 483, 490, 497, 504, 511, 518, 525, 
532, 539, 546, 553, 560. It's an escape technique. The next afternoon, a Teen Vogue magazine just appeared on my bed. All of these publications, at that time of the year, centered on going back to school. On the cover, a teenage girl with hair the color of a banana had the widest smile I've ever seen. The headline read, Does your outfit say what you want it to? No one took responsibility for putting it there. Chapter 4 My parents made a few more strange suggestions before the first day of classes began. I decided they must both have been traumatized as teenagers. On that first morning at an entirely new school, I packed my red-wheeled luggage, designed for the frequent business traveler, but purchased to transport my books and supplies, and we headed out the door to the car. My father and mother both insisted on dropping me off, but neither parent, per my direction, would accompany me inside. I had reviewed the floor plan of the actual buildings, memorized everything from the ceiling heights to emergency exits to electrical outlet locations. I was pre-enrolled in English, math, Spanish, physical education, social studies, and science. With the exception of PE, I knew a lot about the subjects. I'd calculated the amount of time I needed to walk the halls, as well as the cubic feet of the storage closets. I could recite the entire Sequoia student handbook. As we pulled out of the driveway, I was anxious, but I knew for certain one thing. I was ready for middle school. I was wrong. The place is so loud. The girls were shrieking, and the boys were physically attacking each other. At least that's how it appeared. I hated to remove my red Panama hat. It was my signature color, but the hat was designed, after all, for sun protection. I had only taken four steps into the mob when a girl approached. She came right up to me and said, The toilet in the second stall is broken. It's totally gross. She waved her arm in the direction of more meat eaters, and then she was gone. I took a moment to process her statement. Was she giving me some sort of informational heads up? I could see her talking to two girls next to a row of lockers, and she didn't have the same intensity. I, walked, I looked through the swarm and I saw a slight, dark-haired man pulling a wheeled cart. It was loaded with cleaning supplies. Two mops were attached to the back. I stared at him and realized that he and I were dressed alike. But he was pulling a cleaning trolley, not luggage with wheels that have 360-degree rotating option. And then I had a distressing thought. It was possible that the girl believed I was some kind of maintenance worker. I lasted less than three hours. The place made me severely nauseated. For health and safety reasons, I went to the office and insisted on calling home. I waited outside at the curb, and just the sight of my mom's car in the distance made it easier to breathe. When I climbed inside, my mother instantly said, First days are always hard. If I were the kind of person who cried, I'm sure that I would have, but that's not my character. I almost never cry. Instead, I just nodded and stared out the window. I can disappear like that into myself. Once we were home, I spent the rest of the afternoon in my garden. I didn't till the soil or weed the flower beds or try to graft a tree limb. I sat in the shade and listened to my Japanese language instruction. That night, I found myself staring out the window at the sky and counting by sevens would end up being a new record. I tried to roll with it, but what I learned and what was being taught had no intersection. While my teachers labored over the rigors of their chosen subject, I sat in the back, pretty much bored out of my mind. I knew the stuff, so instead I studied the other students. I came to a few conclusions about middle school experience. Clothing was very important. In my opinion, if the world were perfect, Everyone would wear lab coats in educational settings, but that obviously was not happening. The average teenager was willing to wear very uncomfortable attire. From my observation, the older you get, the more you like the word cozy. That's why most of the elderly wear pants with elastic waistbands, if they wear pants at all. This may explain why grandparents are in love with buying grandkids pajamas and bathrobes. The outfits worn by my fellow students were, in my opinion, either way too tight or way too loose. Apparently, having something that actually fits was not acceptable. Haircuts and accessories were defining. The color black was very popular. Some of the students worked very hard to stand out. Others put as much effort into blending in. Music was some kind of religion. It seemed to bring people together and tear them apart. It identified a group 
and apparently prescribed ways to behave and react. Interaction between the male species and the female species was varied and intense and highly unpredictable. There was more touching than they thought there would be. Some students had no inhibitions whatsoever. No attention was paid to nutrition. The word deodorant was not yet understood by over half the boys, and the word awesome was overused. I was only seven days into my latest educational misadventure when I walked into the English class to find Mrs. Klein Sasser making an announcement. This morning everyone will be taking a standardized test administered to all students in the state of California. On your desk you have a booklet and a number two pencil. Do not open the booklets until I give you instructions to do so. Mrs. Klein Sasser signaled that she was ready and she started a clock. And suddenly I decided to pay attention. I took the pencil and began filling in the ovals with the answers. In 17 minutes and 47 seconds, I got up from my seat and walked to the front of the room where I handed the answer form and the booklet to the teacher. I slipped out the door and I thought it was possible that I heard the whole classroom whispering. I received a perfect score. I headed into Mrs. Kleinsasser's class a week later and she was waiting for me. She said, below chance, Principal Rudin needs to see you. My federal middle schoolers buzzed at the news like pollen-soaked worker bees. I went for the door, but at the last minute I turned back. It must have been obvious that I wanted to say something, because the whole room went quiet as I faced my classmates. I found my voice and said, The human corpse flower has blossomed. I'm almost certain no one got it. I took a seat in Principal Rudin's office, which was much less impressive than I had hoped. The anxious woman leaned on her desk and her brow knitted into a strange pattern of angled, intersecting lines. I felt certain if I stared long enough, I would find a math theory in the woman's forehead. But the lines rearranged themselves before I could work out the dynamic and the principal said, Willow, do you know why you're here? I made the decision not to answer, hoping that might cause the skin above her eyes to again knit up. The administrator didn't blink as she stared right at me. You cheated. I found myself answering. I didn't cheat in anything. Principal Rudin exhaled. Your file shows that you were identified several years ago as having high aptitude. Your teachers report no evidence of that. No one in the state got a perfect test score. I could feel my face grow warm, I said. Really? But what I want to do, shout out. Your left elbow displays the fifth form of psoriasis, a urethrodermic condition characterized by intense redness in large patches. A course of 2.5% cortisone cream application, combined with regulated exposure to sunlight, without sunburn of course, would be my recommendation for relief. But I didn't. I had very little experience with authority, and zero experience as a practicing physician, so I didn't defend myself. I just clammed up. What followed was a one-sided, 47-minute long interrogation. The principal, unable to prove the deception, but certain that it had happened, finally let me go. But not before she put in a formal request for me to see a behavioral counselor at the district main offices. That's where the real problem kids were sent. My counselor's name was Del Duke.